very interestingly, an octagonal fountain. Okay, and the idea of Christ being a kind of fountain of life, the fons vitae, is particularly important. And it's also linked, uh, uh, I think, with the um, with the Book of Revelations. Okay, the pure river of the water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the land, from the Book of, of Revelations. This uh, scene here is flanked by uh, images, for instance, of uh, figures uh, such as uh, martyrs of the church, okay, and uh, these individuals are generally reckoned to be apostles. We have other worthies of the uh, ancient world, including what appears to be, if we just zoom in here really quickly on the, on the uh, left here, the poet uh, Virgil, for instance, right, famed for his guiding Dante through the Divine Comedy. There are a number of other figures of this kind. Um, as I've already mentioned, if we just uh, swing across to the right, we can see uh, various uh, martyrs, for instance, St. Stephen here with the um, marks of his, uh, uh, the attributes, I should say, of his martyr and these stones that he's carrying in his uh, costume. Another saint here carrying a tongue, uh, uh, part of the uh, process of martyrdom. Uh, these figures are dressed in red to, con uh, to convey the message that they have indeed paid that ultimate price for their faith. If we go up just a little bit higher here, we can see female uh, uh, confessors of the church, um, including uh, such well-known uh, characters as um, uh, Saint Ursula and, and what have you, Saint Barbara, uh, for instance, with the with the tower uh, uh, right here. That's uh, visible. Let's let that load right there. And then on the other side again, we go uh, all the way across the. Um, confessors of the church. They're not necessarily martyrs. They come out of this gorgeous bank of foliage here. Again, Marian imagery with roses and what have you. And, and art historians and basically botanists have identified all these plants. Um, they come out of the undergrowth there. And let's just zoom out just a little bit and see another interesting group of people further outside that central frame. The knights of the Christian church right here. Uh, you can zoom in on them and the just judges on this side. It's worth pointing out that this panel here on the left is a reconstruction, a 20th century reconstruction. Going back over to the right, we can see the uh, uh, image of, especially on the right here, pilgrims, okay? Uh, and led by the uh, mighty giant St. Christopher. And they're identifiable, for instance, this character right here wears on his forehead the um, shell, the cockle shell, that would have been carried by uh, visitors to Santiago de Compostela uh, uh, in, in Spain. So it's really quite a, um, a quite an extraordinary uh, crew here. Hermits, pilgrims, judges, knights, martyrs, all kinds of things uh, uh, being represented here, all kinds of figures. It's a really remarkable uh, ensemble on, on many, many levels, both theological and, and actual. And then in the upper story, and, and we can close in on this, I think, very nicely as well. In the upper story, we uh, naturally are uh, drawn to the striking uh, figure on the throne. And it's uh, still a, to a certain degree unclear as to who this actually might be. If we look, there seems to be some sort of identifying uh, uh, inscription directly above, rendered in beautiful uh, sort of tour de force of paint. If we go in closer, you can see the the actual behavior of light and reflection. And, where, and what it seems to say is here is God most powerful and divine majesty, etc. Um, the trick in terms of understanding who this might actually be is that it's very rare for God the Father to be flanked by the two individuals that are present. And that's Mary, often in an intercessor role, and uh, John the Baptist. And again, remember that this, this church is originally in the parish of St. John, and that might be why it's prominent. Uh, to see uh, John the Baptist. Um, but John the Baptist is never really seen uh, that close in most examples of European art, that close to God. So he's uh, God, uh, or, or maybe more likely, it's a representation of Jesus enthroned in a second coming, uh, a kind of sense, uh, again, of that last judgment as he judges the elect and the damned alike. And again, Mary at his right hand as an intercessor, beautifully uh, depicted here reading out of a book that would have been very identifiable 
uh, uh, to any viewer, right? With, with books with their uh, um, beautiful coverings and, and, and that, that kind of thing when books were very, very val valuable. This is prior to the age of printing still. Uh, Mary is dressed in extraordinary uh, uh, garments, vestments uh, bedecked with gold and jewels, pearls, rubies, emeralds, what have you. If we go just a little bit higher, we can see her extraordinarily resplendent crown. And art historians have seen very close parallels with jewelry and enamel work uh, uh, that this, um, this crown resembles. Um, again, uh, identifying inscription is above extraordinarily fine work. If we go over to the image of John the Baptist, the same uh, sense of very, very tight detail, uh, extraordinarily precise working. John the Baptist wouldn't typically be shown with too much in the way of finery, but he does indeed get his uh, beautiful green uh, cloak uh, with uh, pearls and what have you around the, the rim. If we look even closer, uh, for instance, details of the background of God, you can see it's, it's uh, let me just go a little bit tighter here, that his, as he raises his right hand, you can see this uh, little emblem right here of mercy, okay, the pelican feeding its young by scratching its, its uh, breast until it bleeds, and this is something that feeds the pelicans. You can see also representations of grapes. These are very typical uh, 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 symbols associated with Christ. As uh, this is, uh, image of sacrifice. Uh, further uh, of, apart, uh, sorry, sorry, on the far sides of the um, the image are in uh, the same way that the patrons and the exterior segregate to the sides are the images of Adam and Eve. Okay, the uh, generators, as it were, of original sin, and they are shown here uh, naked uh, and very kind of human in a sense, almost a deliberate contrast against the resplendent vision that they look at. And th there is that sense in, in this painting that, that Christian uh, belief redeems uh, the original sin, the corruption, the downfall, the mortality of man, and gives way to this uh, extraordinarily beautiful vision. And it's worth implying, and this would have been uh, readily recognized within the church, uh, not just vision, but sound. So, for instance, we can see if we close uh, in just a little bit on these angels, uh, an angel in a beautiful uh, robe right here. Again, the extraordinary handling of light, an angel playing on an organ, a pipe organ. Again, appearances in terms of the handling of light. And if we uh, look a little bit uh, to the side right here, we can see just playing instruments of various kinds, harps and what have you. Um, and then on the other side, let me just uh, go down a little bit here. Hang on a second, I'm on the wrong side. On the other side, we can see uh, a choir, a heavenly choir, reading out of a hymnal, and the remarkable degree to which the painter has rendered uh, various tones and emotional expressions as they're trying to uh, sing uh, t for the glory of uh, God. And again, a beautiful um, rendition of the, the book stand and um, how that actually uh, f would function, say, in a church. It appears to be on a kind of swivel so that people can easily uh, access it. So there's this uh, really quite remarkable uh, range, I suppose, of, of um, objects, figures, um, locations. Again, Jerusalem, uh, the beautiful, let's just look uh, as we wrap up, look at the landscape, for instance, it's in the background. Uh, Jan van Eyck was one of the great pioneers in early European landscape painting for his ability to suggest depth and light and atmosphere. Um, all in all, the, the painting is a striking evocation of paradise and the potential uh, for uh, human redemption uh, thanks to the sacrifice of Christ. It really stands, the Ghent altarpiece, as one of the most remarkable uh, achievements in the history of Western art, and really world art in general, for encapsulating uh, so completely a uh, vision of the spirit, a vision of humanity, religion in general, Christian doctrine in particular, and stands today uh, as one of the great achievements, uh, certainly of the 15th century, if not for all time.